A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. Throughout my career as an FBI agent and criminal profiler, I've often been asked, what exactly is a profile and how are they created? Profiling is part science, part art. The science part employs statistics the Bureau has compiled from thousands of violent crimes, as well as interviews with offenders themselves. But obviously, there's way more to creating a criminal profile of an unknown suspect than just statistics. If that was how to do it, a computer could take the place of an experienced profiler. The term profiler is really less of an FBI term and more of a pet name given by the media for agents certified in crime scene analysis at Quantico. And I found that it's interchangeable both to the media and the general public as well. For that reason, I use the term profiler in my title as it allows people to better understand what I do. I profile unknown offenders of violent crimes. Profilers use psychology, behavioral and crime scene analysis, as well as information gleaned from the autopsy and police reports to analyze the what, when, where, and how of the attack. We scrutinize even the most minute details to see if they suggest a pattern or offer a useful clue as to the offender's personality. By comparing the attack to similar crimes committed in the same way, profilers can pull out the most common characteristics of those known offenders to create a personality and lifestyle sketch of the unsub or unknown subject of the investigation at hand. Profiles are most effective at targeting offenders who act out of psychopathological compulsion rather than, say, the kid who holds up a liquor store with a Saturday night special. He panics and shoots the clerk. In that type of case, the pool of potential thieves with access to illegal handguns is simply too vast. Additionally, there was almost no interaction between the robber and the clerk so there wasn't much behavior to analyze. You've heard me frequently mention a psychiatric diagnosis, but that's for offenders who've been caught and diagnosed by a psychologist or a psychiatrist. But the profile is not an attempt at psychiatric diagnosis, and the whys it addresses can help prevent future crimes, such as why was a certain victim targeted? Why was another released unscathed? Why did the violence of the attacks escalate over time? Is the offender likely to attack again? The who of the formula, tracking down and arresting the actual offender, we leave to the police. A good profile will not only point the cops in the right direction, but can also help predict where the offender is liable to surface. That's the art part. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is a special episode of Killer Psyche. I am often asked by the media to give my opinion on why criminals do what they do. My producer, Julie, and I talk about crime together pretty much every day, and we decided that now might be a great time for me to discuss why I became an FBI agent and profiler and some of the cases that had a large impact on me. I get asked these questions all the time, so we are devoting these next two episodes to answering just that. This episode is The Path to Profiling, Part 1. 
I don't know how many of you guys know this. Well, basically none of you, but I call Candace Captain, and that is short for Captain Evil. But before you go thinking that she's a very evil person, I'm going to let her tell you why she is known as Captain Evil. Right, right. It's not that I'm evil. I was given the nickname Captain Evil. I had a show on Investigation Discovery called Facing Evil with Candace DeLong, where I did prison interviews. I interviewed people convicted of murder. And the crew started calling me Captain Evil, and it stuck. So if you're the captain, then I'm, I don't know. You're the corporal. Maybe the private. The private. You're working your way up. Woohoo! <laughs> so, Candace, tell me the story about how you actually became an FBI agent. Well, um, at the time, I was head nurse at the Institute of Psychiatry of Northwestern University in Chicago. And I was, I guess you might say, becoming a little disillusioned. I, When I went into psychiatric nursing, I had this idea a hope, a dream that that I could really help people, cure people. And after 10 years, I realized it was kind of a revolving door. And of course, that's how serious mental illnesses are. They can be treated, but they can't be cured. Around that time that I was kind of wondering, you know, where was I going with, with my career? I met an FBI agent, And he said to me one day, you should be an FBI agent. Well, this was 1979. And I remember looking at him and saying, in case you haven't noticed, I'm a nurse. I couldn't imagine, why would the FBI want a psychiatric nurse to be an agent? In addition to that, Julie, I didn't even know women could be agents. As it turns out, the first female agent was sworn in in 1972, about five minutes after J. Edgar Hoover died, he did not want any women. Well, that was good timing. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, she was waiting in the wings, and that opened the door. And even though when this agent said to me, you should be an agent, and I just blew it off, like, how ridiculous is that? I couldn't sleep that night. And I thought, wait a minute, you know, that that sounds interesting. That sounds like opportunity knocking. And so I studied up. I took the exam. I I went through the interview process. And I remember I was interviewed by two FBI agents in Chicago. Things are different now, but back then it was two agents. And one was a female agent. She'd been there for a few years. And I remember them saying, we could really use somebody with your background. Then I thought, okay, that's strange. But four months later, I found myself at the academy uh, at Conoco, uh, Virginia, and being trained to become a special agent for the FBI, not a profiler, a special agent. Is there a difference between a regular FBI agent and a special agent? No. All FBI agents, including all federal agents, are designated the title special agent by Congress. After one becomes a special agent, then there are opportunities to specialize in certain fields, such as being technically trained or SWAT trained, and in my case, uh, crime scene analyst trained, aka profiler. But I wasn't a profiler yet. That would come many years later. I had never shot a gun, uh, trained to shoot, shotguns, handguns, you name it. When I graduated four months after meeting graduation day, getting your credentials and, you know, being assigned to your office, I knew I was going back to the Chicago division. I was probably in the best physical shape I'd ever been in. And for about one week, I held the push-up record for female agent push-up record. I think I did 50 perfect military push-ups. And that was that. That never happened again. (laughs) (laughs) You're not still cranking out those push-ups? No, no. No. Well, I've never been able to do 50 perfect push-ups, even when I was in my 20s. It actually wasn't a requirement, but the number 50, I thought it was. They told me that I had to run two miles in eight minutes. I didn't understand that that was Olympian performance at the time. So I started running, stopped smoking, started running, The push-ups, I thought I had to do 25. 
that first day at the academy. And turns out that wasn't true at all. But I think there were times when we used the Marine Corps obstacle course. And basically, it was like boot camp, part of it. (laughs) And when you weren't on the firearms range, learning how to shoot or scaling walls with an M16 or crawling on your stomach uh, in water with an M16, you were in a classroom learning the law. I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Did you feel like you had to be better than the male students because you were kind of, you were basically groundbreaking at that time? Did you feel like physically you had to be able to match them? Well, in terms of the physical requirements and the firearms requirements, everybody has to do the same thing and pass a test with a certain score. There's one exception, and that is a pull-up. Women got a little bit of a break, female agents, on the pull-up. But other than that, you know, everybody had to get at least a, I think, 80% score for firearms. 80% of your bullets went in the kill zone um, of the target, and everybody had to uh, score a certain amount of points to be passed on for physical. Everybody had to pass tests with a minimum percentage. If you didn't, you had the opportunity to take the test again. And if you didn't pass at that time, you packed your bags and left. So to answer to your question, we had 23 men in my class and seven women when we started out. And at the end, I think we graduated all but one of the women and a couple of the guys. And at the time, 1980, women were new. Uh, We weren't really welcome by everybody in the FBI. And some of the instructors at the academy, I think, worked a little hard to wash the women out. And some of them, not all of them. And that would kind of be the deal for the next 10 years. From 1980 to 1990, women were constantly being challenged. Women and minorities, actually. I'm not saying the FBI is misogynist or racist. It's just... That's how it was. That's kind of how the world was. Women were getting into so many professions. It was all fertile ground for women, but it was challenging. And a lot of the challenges came from the guys. I was raised with three brothers, two older, one younger. We're all pretty close. We're all two years apart. I was used to being teased. I was used to being challenged. I was very competitive with my brothers You know, one of my brothers uh, is a scientist. I was like, you know, study hard, do as well on the science test as he did. We're constantly challenging each other. And then there were the physical challenges of fighting with my brothers, not throwing punches, but, you know, how kids wrestle. And my dad taught us all how to wrestle, how how to break away if somebody grabbed us, that kind of thing. And I think that really helped me deal with some of the nonsense uh, that went on for the next 10 years with the guys. There was a guy on my squad. I walked by his desk every morning, said, good morning. And I'd say his name and he wouldn't even look up for one year. (laughs) He wouldn't speak to me. And one day, a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of us on the squad said, Hey, let's go get lunch or whatever. And I stood up to go. And (laughs) that, that person, that agent he looked at me and went, I'm not going if she's going. So that's just how it was. And I could laugh that off. I thought, well, too bad for him. He's missing out on the fun. So I think being raised with three brothers, it kind of paved the way for me to deal with um, the stuff. Now, the second 10 years of my career, 90 to 2000, most of that nonsense had gone away. And it's been 20 years now, and I still have friends that are on board meaning employed as agents. And they tell me that that kind of stuff that I went through doesn't exist anymore. I hope that's true. It probably is. What did your brothers and your family think when you said, hey, I'm no longer going to be a nurse. I'm going to go over and be an FBI agent. (laughs) <laughs> well, um, one of my brothers actually was with the FBI at the time. He was a computer specialist. He, he was very excited for me. My dad was, I, I guess, maybe a little worried. 
But my dad, when he was a teenager in Cleveland in the 30s, he was undercover informant for the FBI. And wait, your father was an undercover for the FBI as well? He was an informant when he was a teenager. He was working in a speakeasy and Elliot Ness was his handler. Now, Elliot Ness was not an FBI agent. A lot of people think he was. He was a treasury agent and he got Al Capone and put him away. After that, took a job as superintendent of public safety of Cleveland, Ohio, which is where my grandparents lived with my dad. And it was the Depression. His dad was a builder. Nobody was building houses during the Depression. And so my dad got a job in a speakeasy. It paid well. And he kept his ears open and his mouth shut. I imagine that the police, uh, Chicago police, were interested in that speakeasy, and they recruited my dad. I didn't learn this until I was in my 20s, and my dad told me that. And he only told the story once. But he was in that position for five years, uh, helped his family stay afloat, and put himself through college. When I told him I was going to be an FBI agent, he was very pensive about it, and he said, you know, honey— The criminal mind, there's nothing like it. He said, be careful. Don't ever be fooled. I work with those kinds of people for, I don't know, years when he was a kid. In fact, every informant for the FBI gets a code name. My dad's code name was The Kid. He had strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes. He was Irish. And um, he was called The Kid. Eventually, his handler became a very famous FBI agent Melvin Purvis was an agent assigned to the Cleveland division. So so in a way, I, it's a long way to, to get around to the fact that my dad was excited for me. He was a little worried. But all in all, when I graduated from the academy, he gave me a gift. And that gift was a uh, 38 caliber five-shot handgun revolver that was my sidearm. Now, that may sound like a strange gift for a man to give his daughter, but it was just what I needed. And I, of course, I had my bureau issue gun, a much larger 38 uh, revolver six-shot, but most cops and agents carry a sidearm. And that was... Uh, It was kind of like my dad was bestowing almost like a crown. Like, you made it. You did it. He was very proud of me. And now I'm starting to tear up. Thank you. Sorry. (laughs) I tend to make people cry, sometimes on purpose, (laughs) sometimes not. Um, That's awesome because I bet when you wore that sidearm, you felt like your dad was watching over you or protecting you. I always felt like my dad was watching over me. My dad was uh, very dynamic. He loved his four kids to death. Because of the life he had in the Depression and working at the speakeasy and, and being around all these criminals, he knew what life was all about, you know, and, and there's an ugly side to it. And so he was very, very involved in our lives in that setting goals you know, doing well in school, never getting in trouble, things like that, and and not turning his back. I mean, being a very, very involved parent. And I would have to say that my father is responsible for who I became. Not only psychiatric nurse, head nurse, then an FBI agent. And it was him. It was his influence. Well, your whole family is very successful. So your parents must have done something right. People used to ask me, uh, "What, my gosh, you know, what are your parent? What did your parents feed you kids for breakfast?" And I would say, "A big bowl of terrorism." <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean, Candace? <laughs> Means well, I, my, my dad was strict. My parents were strict, but you know, fair. You know, do well in school, do as well as you can, and and don't get in trouble, and always be honest and kind. And um, don't veer away from these <laughs> expectations. So, so the big bowl of terrorism was do right or 
face the music. Well, I think that's probably what went wrong in my life. I just got Cheerios in the morning. So <laughs> I'll have to yell at my parents about that. Um, when you were in the in the academy, was there anything that was particularly hard for you that hmm. you weren't as gifted in? Shooting, learning how to shoot well. I never really enjoyed firearms. A lot of people do. Some women do. Some men don't like it. I never doubted that I could shoot someone if I had to, to defend myself or to defend someone else's life. That didn't concern me at all. Hey, you know, I'm a post-World War II baby. With my brothers, we were all raised playing war. One of my brothers, Keith, was always the general and I was the buck private and we'd be running around our house. We had several acres of land in Arizona and, you know, with our toy guns and all that. I never was worried about that. Um, But I didn't really care for it that much. When I saw the gun, it was a tool. I had to have it. So maybe that. Everything else I love. I love the classroom instruction. I acquired knowledge, education about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights for the first time. I've heard about those things, of course, but they didn't really hit home until I had an instructor in our legal class, like we had law one and law two, and it's what FBI agents need to know about the law, what you can do, what you can't do, how the law protects people and that kind of thing. And I remember and our instructors were just mesmerizing. Really, I'd sat there spellbound. We did have a lot of uh, lawyers in our class becoming agents. A lot of FBI agents have law degrees. I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed how little I knew about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Fourth Amendment, which guarantees a person's right against unreasonable search and seizures and warrants and why are they necessary and how are they acquired and and all these things. And it was really wonderful. I loved it. And there was one day uh, we had an agent from the behavioral science unit that was new at the FBI Academy studying the behavior. And it was Robert Ressler and John Douglas one day talked to our class and they gave us just kind of a brief overview of what was going on. What was the behavioral science unit doing? They were learning how to not only categorize violent crimes, but how to find clues at a crime scene that might help identify the type of person that did it. And that is criminal profiling. And I remember John Douglas projected a crime scene, a horrible crime scene of a raped and murdered woman thrown in a ditch. And then he started to tell the class how this and that and this and that about the crime scene said this and that and this and that about who may have done this, that it wasn't one offender, that it was two. And this is why they came up with two. And it turned out that it developed a profile that led to the offenders of this woman's murder. And I remember thinking, this is crazy. The slides, the crime scenes, very difficult to look at. Most of the crimes that lend themselves to profiling, the victims are women and children. I was a 30-year-old woman. I had a little boy. So it's it didn't last forever, but in the early days of that thing. Oh my God. And a lot of men, of course, had trouble looking at these these crime scenes also. I mean, to think a human being could do that to another human being? Oh my gosh, that's horrible. But it's also true. And I never dreamt at that time at the academy, just being exposed to a little bit of it, that I would eventually become a profiler. Well, that actually is what I was going to ask you. You were at the academy, you graduated, you went to the Chicago Division, correct? Yes. So what were you doing in the Chicago Division? Well, for the first four years of my career, the first year I was assigned after a while to the terrorism squad in Chicago as the first woman on that squad. And uh, I was running around. It was great. I was running around Chicago with some of my colleagues, following terrorists, seeing, where, watching where they were going. There was one suspect, a suspected terrorist that we were following. And every Tuesday night, he would leave his house to go somewhere. And we 
had information that he had been recruited by the terrorist organization we were watching. And so the case agent, his name is Rick Hahn, and he thought, well, let's watch this guy and follow him and see, hey, it might result in him taking us to a safe house, you know, or something like that to to move the case along. So we would set up on this guy's house, several agents in cars and whatnot. And one night he got on a subway. And so the next Tuesday when we assumed, okay, he's he's going somewhere, he's getting on the subway. And then the following week, I got on the subway with him. You know, where was he going? He would get off at one stop and then cross the platform and get on a subway going the opposite direction. One time he changed his jacket. He turned it inside out. It was a reversible jacket. He did not want to be recognized and was doing things that indicated he might be being watched and therefore he had to do these what they call dry cleaning techniques to shake a tail meaning if you're being tailed you got to shake it and it was about a year of Tuesdays before we finally got him at a destination getting off the subway i was down on the street with my partner watching the subway platform And we followed him for a while, and then he turned down a street. So the following Tuesday after that, we were at that street waiting for him. Of course, he didn't see us. We were discreet surveillance. And then we saw him go into a building. Eventually, we talked to the landlord. And long story short, oh, wait a minute, it's too late for that. But uh, (laughs) he, when we got into where he was, it was a safe house that was a bomb factory. And rather than just arrest everybody right away, the case agent, Rick, he said, let's install a camera in there, a closed circuit TV, and monitor and see what's going on. We might get more information. And we did. Eventually, the camera caught these terrorists at a table making a bomb and cleaning weapons and things like that. There was dynamite found in there under the sink, and it was enough to blow up the entire building. And and this was a huge building and unstable dynamite. So that was moved out when they weren't there. And phony dynamite was put back while we watched. And the list of people that were eventually arrested was profound. So I was doing that my first year. It was very exciting. And as soon uh, kind of as that was wrapping up, I was assigned to the Tylenol investigation. We had an episode on that. The Tylenol murders seven people in Chicago uh, dropped dead in a period of five days. They didn't know each other. They weren't connected. And it turns out they had each ingested Tylenol that they had recently purchased. And the Tylenol was tainted with potassium cyanide. So I was assigned to that. And I was just over the moon that I was on. This case was consuming the <laughs> United States. It was the first big national crime event that I'd been involved in. And it was, wasn't was just a Chicago story. People are watching this on the news going, my gosh, that, that could happen anywhere. So my partner would pick me up at six in the morning. We'd run around Chicago covering leads. I'd get home at nine or 10 and watch the news. And there on the news was the case I was working on. I, I just, I was so excited. I could hardly sleep. Oh my gosh, this is why I became an agent to be involved in really, really important stuff for the community, the community where I lived. And it was it was beyond exciting. It was everything that I'd hoped for at the Academy. When you were working on Tylenol, were you a single mom then? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what did your child think about his mom, you know, going <laughs> to work, looking at, looking for terrorists? Like how old was Seth around then? It was, he was. Seth was uh, six years old, uh, five years old when I was at the academy. And when Tylenol happened, he was about seven going on eight. He thought it was cool that his mom carried a gun. Basically, you know, mom, why do you have that gun? Well, I need it 
in case I, you know, don't go into a lot of details with the little kid. And I found out years later that my son, when I went to visit my folks, he said to my mother, uh, mom carries a gun. And my mother said, well, why does she do that, Seth? And in case she, in case she has to shoot someone, but only the bad ones. <laughs> so keep it simple. And then as the years went by, um, there was a time I was working drug matters and I was working with DEA agents. And by that time, he was a teenager, early adolescence. And then as the years went by and he became more aware of what cops and agents do and uh, that periodically cops and agents get in gunfights, he became more concerned. And I can say that when I retired in July of 2000, that I think that was the happiest day of his life to that point. It's like, oh. wow, my mom's off the streets. She's not carrying a gun. Now I can relax. So it was 20 years of his life of knowing that mom carried a gun and chased bad guys. And you had to go undercover a lot. So you would be gone for periods of time. Is that right? Well, you didn't have to go undercover. You don't have to go in the cover of the FBI. It's strictly voluntary. But there did come a time in 1996, I'd been an agent 16 years, and I went undercover on the Unabom investigation in, outside of Helena, Montana, on our suspect, Ted Kaczynski. How did he take that? How old was he? He was okay. He was in college. He was a sophomore in college. And um, I was with my partner, John, and many other FBI agents. And it's not something that he dwelled on, but I think he had the the belief, the attitude that, okay, mom's going to be okay. She knows what she's doing. She's got all these FBI agents. They all know what they're doing. And and he he trusted. And frankly, it's rare for an FBI agent or any kind of federal agent to be killed in the line of duty. I think in the over 100 years, maybe 112 years the FBI has existed, less than 45 agents have been killed in the line of duty. Because unlike a, a uniform cop on the street, which is the most visible form of government, is a uniform cop on the street with a gun. And a cop may have to and do respond to problems going on right now. Whereas the FBI, um, we investigate crimes generally that have already happened. For the most part, it is entirely possible that something might come across something. You're you're in a bank and somebody pulls a gun and you're there. What are you going to do? But that's pretty rare. But because of investigations and preparing a case, for example, the Unabom investigation went on 16 years, but we were tipped off uh, by Kaczynski's brother about three months before we arrested him. And we had to do all kinds of investigation. So by the time FBI agents go to arrest someone, it's well planned out. There's lots of people involved. There's lots of planning so that no one gets hurt, so that the arrestee doesn't get hurt and we don't get hurt. Th there was one time I was, I would have to admit, I was frightened. We would do these uh, drug raids. Sometimes we'd meet at four in the morning at a, at a local gym. And uh, it would be maybe a hundred agents in teams of four going all over the city arresting people. And the drug world is a very volatile, violent world. So, of course, we're wearing vests and all that. But in those kinds of situations, plus I'd be assigned to work sometimes with people I didn't know. And it's always better to work with someone you do know. Some of those times, I think that probably happened five or six times in the three years that I was working drug matters. I would have to say my pulse went up and I was glad when it was over. <laughs> Nothing feels better than taking off your bulletproof vest. <laughs> I wanted to do everything in the world there was to do. And so I worked terrorism. I worked at a small satellite office and got involved in the Tylenol investigation. Then I worked foreign counterintelligence, known in the Bureau as FCI. I loved it. Here, here's what the deal is. It is the purview of the Federal Bureau of Investigation to monitor the activities of foreign spies in the United States and 
maybe Americans here who are helping that person spy for a foreign country, such as Russia or China. And one third of the FBI's manpower and woman power, resources, money, computers, cars, goes into the, uh, foreign counterintelligence. I loved it. My whole life was like a spy novel. <laughs> I just, I just absolutely loved it. And my criteria country that I was assigned to was a satellite country of Russia and of Poland. But then an opportunity came up. It turns out the Behavioral Science Unit wanted to train one FBI agent in every field division. I think there were 59 at the time to train them in the art and science of profiling. That agent would not be assigned to Quantico, but would, of course, have their own field division assignment, in my case, Chicago. And that agent would work with the behavioral science unit, developing cases that came up in that division and teaching police about profiling and different kinds of crimes, because most of the crimes that lend themselves to profiling are not federal violations. They are state violations, murder, rape, things like that. It's a federal violation. It happens on federal land. So in order to get cases, and the FBI has always been involved in working with local police, is what we call assistance to local police. So that's what that trained agent would do. And so I raised my hand for that, and I got it. And with another agent in Chicago who had been a Chicago homicide detective. And so he and I were partners in profiling. We were both trained in that. And that's how that happened. And that, that happened in 1984. I'd been in the Bureau four years at that point. This is amazing and fascinating. This is fun. Hey, I, Julie, I've been telling these stories for years. Oh, well, lucky me, I get to listen to them. So there you go. And now everybody else does too. Thanks, okay. Candace. Have see, a good day. see you next week. All right, bye. bye. Next week on Killer Psyche, I'll continue my conversation with Julie. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Joshua Morales and Maxwell Carney with research and editing assistance from Ann Liu. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is production manager. And Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark and Lindsay Whistler are production assistants. And the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner, and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marsha Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Whoa.